Hello, I'm Sarah Manasra. And I'm Virgin Odrash, and this is Clarinet and Community. A video series dedicated to clarinet, community, and belonging. Welcome. Bienvenidos. <laughs> Greetings, clarinetists. During Women's Month, Clarinet and Community spend some time speaking to women who are part of the historical clarinet community. This is a community that embraces the sharing of knowledge and equipment in extraordinary ways. And these women have embraced and found their place within it. In our second interview, we spoke with Dr. Emily Worthington. I think one of the most interesting things from this interview for me was examining how the scholarship of performing historically informed uh, performances can actually build, attract, and engage audiences. That scholarship and the way that it builds a story is something that I believe all clarinet communities can learn from. I really hope you enjoy this fantastic interview. Dr. Emily Worthington was gracious in sharing with us her entrepreneurial spirit how to drive just to play with others and the need to communicate and collaborate in a community is what spurred her along to form some amazing opportunities performance-wise and create a YouTube page that is sensational in its scholarship and its discussion of historically informed performance. So we are here today with an amazing clarinetist, Dr. Emily Worthington. I'm so excited to finally meet you. We have been in correspondence via Twitter and email and websites, and it's been great just getting to know you and following your career through YouTube and all the things you've done and all the exploits you've shared through your social media. But it is a pleasure to kind of see, I would like to say face-to-face, -face, but Zoom to Zoom here with Sarah and I. Could you please just introduce yourself and tell us about your journey through and to clarinet and historical clarinet and all of those wonderful, wonderful things? Yeah, so, um, oh gosh, where to start? So I'm uh, based in the UK, um, in the north of England, uh, in Yorkshire, and I teach at the University of York. Um, and as a clarinet player, actually, my journey started there. So I, I was a, a student there studying with two amazing early clarinet players, um, early and modern clarinet players, Alan Hacker and Leslie Schatzberger. And um, when I was, I guess, in my second year of my undergrad, um, uh, Leslie kind of said, well, have you, you know, there's, there's a historical clarinet in that cupboard over there. Why don't you try it? And I got this thing out, that's not okay. And, um, and I just remember, I, I still remember the feeling of it. It was so tactile and the connection with the sound felt so direct. And it's, it's kind of an, it became kind of an addictive thing. Anyway, over the course of my studies, I started to do more, play more on historical clarinets as well as modern clarinets. Um, I went down to study in London um, and continued. And it, it became increasingly a thing I, I felt like I wanted to focus on um, because I love the instruments. I love the 18th and 19th century repertoire. And also the more time I spent with other people in historical performance kind of world, the more I felt like I'd found my tribe, um, I, I, the more I felt a connection with, with that community, I think, in that way of thinking. So that's sort of how it started. Um, I also, kind of in my 20s, studied uh, in France as well. There, there's a, a scheme which still runs um, in a place called Saint, which is in sort of Western France. Um, and it's a, a master's program. And, but rather than, it's not a residential program, you go over like a 10 or 12 times over the course of a couple of years and do a lot of chamber music and orchestral projects um, and have lessons and take seminars and stuff. And that was a really important kind of development experience for me because essentially you can't learn a wind instrument on your own, right? The instrument we play is an ensemble instrument. And especially if you're talking about 18th and 19th century repertoire, it's kind of, you know, solo clarinet repertoire from that period unaccompanied isn't really a thing. And even with piano isn't, that's just not how the instrument was used back then. So actually to understand these historical clarinets, you have to play with other people. Um, they, they, they're they're, a, they're a group animal, they're a pack animal. So the chance to go and do that for, for several years um, in that program in France was really where I, where I kind of developed. It was my sort of, my uh, incubation stage, I think, where I came out the other end kind of knowing how I wanted to play these instruments and what I wanted to do. What was also super interesting about that was the chance to work with um, teachers and other students from all over the world. 
So people who are studying in Spain with Lorenzo Coppola, people who are studying in Holland with Eric Hoprich, people who are studying in the States. And, and it, so that was also a chance to see kind of um, the different approaches people were taking to the instrument. Um, just like the modern clarinet, there's, there's a lot of different ways you can approach it. And actually, because there are so many unresolvable questions about how clarinetists played these instruments, particularly in the 18th century, um, there are lots of possible ways, you know, possible solutions, possible ways to approach it. And, and so, yeah, that whole kind of formative period was, my, was, was you know, my way of kind of finding my way, I guess, with, with early clarinet. Yeah, I love that you mentioned the community because uh, and that the community is kind of built into the practice because of the uh, just the nature of it. Um, can you tell me a little bit about um, the, the what about the, the historical clarinet community or the historical instrument community that really um, was important to you? Yeah, I mean, historical clarinet world is quite small. Um, I wouldn't say I, I wouldn't say that we we all know we all know, all know each other, but there's there's you know it's it's more often than not you'll turn up on a gig and you'll know most people there, right? I mean it's it's not a, it's not a huge community, um, but yeah, I it's um as part of the early music world more generally it's it's uh I think people who get involved in this kind of music making tend to um have a certain relationship and a certain attitude of of kind of being inquisitive, wanting to go into more depth to understand their repertoire and their instruments and also the cultural and social context it came from very often as well, because those things are, are inseparable really. Um, and then the early clarinet community tends to be within that. It's, it's quite, quite a, it is quite a social and quite a kind of small community because if you play Baroque violin or Baroque oboe or Baroque flute, you're part of this big kind of Baroque music scene, right? If you're a clarinet player, we don't have that repertoire. So we tend to, we, we join the, the party a little bit later and we tend to be a bit more self-contained. Um, and we go in as classical music specialists rather than Baroque music specialists. And what I think what I love about it is that whenever I meet another early clarinet player, you know, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be building or fixing up their own instruments and they'll be rooting around in libraries, finding music and making additions and making arrangements and making their own ensembles. And it's just a very kind of, um, uh, it's just a very lively community with a lot of very broad interests and often really, really broad sets of skills as well, actually. That's brilliant. And actually, I love that you acknowledge sort of like the resilience it kind of takes to really kind of get into this world and dig around and find the repertoire and find your people and make and make a home for yourself in what is ostensibly you know decades centuries old history right and you're finding yourself and finding a voice there so i love all of that and the question i had is in this like these skills that you you find that a lot of these clarinetists have when they're joining historical performance practice um, do you see those skills being transferable? Like, are there any things that you gleaned from your experience in historical performance that you've been able to bring over to modern, or do you play modern that much, and and vice versa? Like, do these are these skills transferable, and how have you used these skills outside of the context of historical um, performance practice or historically informed performance practice? Yeah, I mean, hugely transferable. Like. Um... I've gone through different phases with how much I play the modern clarinet since I kind of I specialize in, in period clarinets. And so it kind of I these days I tend to only pick up the modern clarinet for, for special occasions, right? It has to be it has to be a really fun project to want to get kind of get back in practice, get that set of reads going again. Um, <laughs> um, so it kind of comes and goes for me that. But I mean, yeah, that you learn so much by playing these earlier instruments. The um when it first starts out, it can feel like it feels like like going back to being a beginner again, right? It's it's actually really hard because a lot of the uh, the physical and technical devices we use on the modern clarinet don't transfer back. Um, particularly, I, I I would characterize, for instance, um, in terms of embouchure and breast support, the early clarinet um, needs an awful lot less muscle strength and a lot less kind of power power of support, and it's more about flexibility and air speed and it's kind of a whole different approach to, to the, the feeling of the instrument. So when you first start out, it can feel like, oh my God, I'm a kid on, on roller skates. You know, it's kind of scary. Um, and when I first started doing it, I found it really hard to switch between. And I, I would find that playing the early clarinet really messed up my modern technique and like it was, it was just, it was hard. But then after a while, when, when you get, um, when you build up a stronger relationship with, with let's say the classical clarinet, 
um, when that becomes kind of stronger and more unstable and and kind of embedded in in your physical technique then then one it becomes easier to switch between different instruments and two um, I found it's informed my approach to playing generally hugely so the level of flexibility you need on the early clarinet particularly in terms of sensitivity to voicing I mean we talk a lot about embouchure on modern clarinet but actually I kind of I, I, the more I the more I play different kinds of clarinets, the more I'm convinced that, that that's that's kind of for me at least is the wrong focus. Like everything comes from voicing. It doesn't really matter what my lips are doing, as long as as long as what's going on back here, the singing bit is is working right. Um, so if I take all of that across, the uh, the level of attention and perception you need of sound and intonation on early instruments as well is hugely useful for transferring to the modern instruments because. Because they're, they're um, I'm not going to say they're out of tune. They're very, very flexible, and they're very sensitive, and their natural intonation is very uneven. So you can play them actually really, very well in tune, but you have to be very active about it. You have to be constantly attending to uh, your pitch and what's going on around you and where you are in the harmony of a piece, all those kind of things. Um, and that level of, well, once, again, once you've learned to, to hear where a note needs to be and how to really play in tune, then that, that counts for everything, right? You can do that on anything then. So the, that, those skills are, are massively transferable. And I, I think, and I think anyone would agree with me who plays early instruments, is that it does change you. It, it, the time you spend with them changes you as a player, like in terms of your relationship with, with a wind instrument, um, in, a, in a way that's really, really useful, actually, in a way that, that Kind of offer, offers all sorts of opportunities um, when you go back to the to the modern instrument. And I definitely also I think the tendency, certainly when I go back to a modern clarinet now, I probably think differently in terms of setup as well, how much resistance I want, what kind of reeds I want to play on, than I might have done when I was in my early twenties as a kind of full time modern player. Like I'm I'm less interested in having you know a really strong setup and and relying on a reed to make this big kind of overtony sound and stuff. I just definitely. I feel like I feel like I I'm more kind of what I'm doing with my body is now more important than than what the instrument is giving me in a way. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it has like this idea of a more holistic approach to music making, where the music is actually happening in your body physically, and the instrument's a conduit. And I have to say, I wish my students were here right now because I talk about the degree to which I talk about voice <laughs> in a lesson. <laughs> Yes, that's all I wanted to say. Like, yes, thank you so much for that. Um, so did you, I, so you talked about the benefits and you kind of touched on like um, maybe some of the challenges you had initially. Did you discover any setbacks entering the community of um, um, historically informed practice or hair historical clarinet or even just like playing the instrument? Like any setbacks, anything that sort of made you feel like, oh, maybe I need to like readjust or re reframe the way I approach this or anything that you like to share with us? I think like any kind of musical development, especially in that in that period from being kind of, you know, a, a sort of a young student through to through to a young professional, through to establishing. It's always a difficult like there are always setbacks. Right. I mean, so um, I mean, it's some of the kind of with early clarinet, some of the practical things I think we probably all face is that you can't walk into a shop and try 10 instruments and choose the one you like. You have to kind of you have to go through this whole research procedure, put down an order with someone in another country for something which is going to be delivered in three years time for a huge amount of money and hope that you I mean, it's really like, you know, so it, it, it's a it, before you even start, there's this kind of it that feels like quite a big hurdle to get over. Um, it may be it may be slightly easier now. I feel like the second hand market is a little bit more uh, of a thing for early clarinets now, which it definitely wasn't in the late 90s, early 2000s when I was when I was kind of going. Um, so that that very practical thing of simply getting instruments um, is, is, I think, a huge challenge for any player starting out. Um, and then, to be honest, when you're working with historical instruments, there are setbacks every week. Like you think you've got the measure of it. You think like, OK, yeah, I get this instrument. It gets me. We're, oh, yeah, we're singing together. It's great. And then you pick it up a couple of days. Later, it's like, this doesn't work. <laughs> Why does this not work? Um, partly because as, as machines, they're more... Um, uh, they're less robust right so the materials they're made of and those kind of things are more susceptible to come out of out of adjustment and stuff so you know it's working great and you go to the rehearsal and something something just stops closing properly or or the, or the wood cracks or the so there are always those kind of practical issues and that's why um 
many, many early clarinet players get into repairing and making. It's partly so that when you're stuck in a church somewhere in rural Germany and a bit drops off your instrument, it's nice to know what to do about it. Like, you know, it's nice to know your options there. Um, so I would highly re recommend any player, start to learn to maintain your instruments. <laughs> it's not that difficult. Um, I also, in terms, of, in terms of setbacks, I mean, the other thing is I think what I talked about the clarinet being a sort of a late arriver at the early music party is that I think we have to, we have to work quite hard to make opportunities for playing um, because we can't just rely on orchestral opportunities because I mean, the early music world in most places is, is orchestral world is very focused on Baroque repertoire, right? So it's not that often that we get invited to projects. And when it, when it is, it tends to be a Haydn creation, Mozart requiem, you know, a fairly limited set of repertoire. So that doesn't afford a huge amount of space to develop as a player. Um, and so I think it's really important, therefore, to make your opportunities. So I, I have a wind ensemble. And that, that's been the place where I've really grown as a musician is by, is by working in that group and that repertoire, which is, which is much more varied, much more challenging and interesting um, than, than turning out to play the, much though I love the Haydn creation, when you've done it a dozen times in a year, it becomes hard to practice. You can't really practice it. And yet you have to turn up, right, in, you know, in practice. So you have to find other things to do. To keep, it's, it's like being an athlete. You, you, have to, you have to find ways to keep in training, um, which sometimes aren't entirely related to the job you're being asked to do. Um, I have a, a, a quick question about, um, we talked just a bit about the community of the historical clarinetists, but uh, you're mentioning creating opportunities for yourself. Can you tell me about the community of the audience members that you draw? Like, is, uh, do you find that, that, that there is a, a community of people that are quite interested in this, in, in the music that you're performing and the historically informed performances? Um, what, what kind of goes into building these ensembles and then finding um, the, the people that, that are fulfilled by the, the product you're, you're creating? Yeah, I mean, there's an existing strong community, um, I know in, in Europe, and I think in the States, in, in some places in the States as well, around the, uh, the idea of early music. So there is these existing kind of communities of audiences who are often brought together by a venue or by a particular concert series or concert organization. So um, we definitely play for them for early music festivals, those kinds of things. Um, with classical repertoire, that can sometimes be like very much on the on the edge of what the, of their kind of remit of interest because they see it as the kind of being a bit mainstream. <laughs> um, so, but again, so with my with my box of Watford and Brass, which is my harmony, um, doing late 18th and early 19th century repertoire, we also definitely do a, lo a lot of work playing for sort of chamber music societies, chamber music concert series. Um, where we're, we're their novelty act, you know, among all the string quartets and, and leader recitals and piano recitals. Um, so we, can, we, kind of, we, we can kind of slot into both of those things. I think there's also a growing interest in, in this whole kind of scene among younger audiences. And that's because um, early music groups and the early music scene are very good at building stories around the music we play because we're looking at it in the context of a time and a place and specific people who were who it, you know it emerged from and often specific performing contexts as well which which because concerts weren't really a thing right till till the 19th century so if you're looking at 18th century repertoire you're looking at all sorts of uh, different very particular performing contexts and i think once once you can start telling a story around a particular kind of music and creating perhaps a sense of atmosphere around a performance that takes people to a place to an imagine imagine a, a place in their imagination that's that's a thing which can really appeal beyond the sort of more traditional um, uh, chamber music society type audiences. That's brilliant. I never thought about that because you're right, like the instruments, the music, they all had a very specific time and place in which they occurred and that time and place has a story. And so being able to package the performance into a story into the the, the 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 historical context of which the piece was written because like you're right when we go to concerts modern concerts we don't always get that background you might read it in like the program notes but it's not really so part and parcel to the experience whereas i can imagine in historical concerts 
and performances, that's really key. I love that you mentioned your 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 group, um, Boxwood and Brass. Could you tell us more about that? Because I I I like I said, I've watched your YouTube videos, and I'm so I just love the work that you do. So I just would love for you to just talk about it more, share. Yeah, um, I mean, Boxwood and Brass has been going for about ten years, nearly ten years. It came about sort of organically, um, late two thousands, early two thousand tens. They're a group of us whim players, all kind of, you know, kicking around in, in the early music scene in London. Um, and one, and so we started to get together to read through some of this harmony music repertoire. So this is repertoire for typically either wind octet, perhaps plus a double bass or contra bassoon, or for sextet, clarinets, oboes, sorry, clarinets, horns and bassoons. Um, and we, you know, we wanted to kind of know a bit more of this repertoire beyond your Mozart wind serenades and things. And so we started to get here to read through some stuff, including arrangements as well. Um, and over the course of a few years, we kind of found a core group of people who wanted to kind of make this a more, more regular, serious thing. And we made the group. Um, and yeah, and, and it's now been going yeah, kind of officially since 2013. And, and we, we, do, we do concerts. We've done three CDs as well, uh, two CDs of Beethoven arrangements one CD of music related to the clarinetist Franz Tausch, who is the teacher of Heinrich Behrmann. Um, and we just love taking this music to, to audiences, even fairly kind of, um, you know, kind of serious, experienced classical music audiences tend not to know much about wind ensemble music, right? It's very peripheral, it's quite a niche. Um, and I also love, the idea that through this music, we can tell a slightly different version of music history, actually, because music history, I mean, we can be honest, music history has been written by the pianists and the string players and the singers, really, you know, the, the opera conductors, hasn't it? I mean, that's how we see music history. And it's often, I think, hard for us as clarinet players to work out where our instrument fits into that. We have these few pieces that are, are held up as these kind of, you know, kind of um, masterpieces, but like, what were clarinet players doing the rest of the time, actually? I've always wondered that, like, if you were a clarinet player in 1780s Vienna, what did you do all day? Because you didn't just play the Mozart clarinet, if you didn't play the Mozart clarinet quintet at all, unless you're Anton Stadler. So you must have done something between getting up in the morning and going to bed at night. And so looking at this harmony re repertoire has been one way of, for me as a researcher as well, of getting into that um, and trying to find out a bit more about the, the culture of being a whim player um, in the sort of late 18th and early 19th century, particularly. So uh, I have a question. I am. Um, I know that Virgie's going to get into the community, um, but I've always been the person like every time I um, uh, hear people talk about historical clarinet, I get really fired up and I want to try it. But I feel like I'm just peeking in the window. I've never really found or or uh, created those opportunities for myself. So um, I have kind of a two questions. I'd like to know more about the equipment. I know that there's just a lot more of it and um, and and kind of what's what's different about it. And then uh, how how do you think someone like me should should explore this equipment and start getting into it? How do I find it? Yeah, I mean, like so. So, yeah, a lot of equipment, because basically um, we're talking about an instrument that was that only really came into mainstream use um in the second half of the 18th century and it was ev like all instruments it was evolving very quickly so um it goes from being almost not a thing to being what pretty much resembles a modern clarinet in the space of 100 years and this is all against the, back the background of the industrial revolution as well so there are a lot of general developments in manufacture that cut that affect wind instrument uh design so basically you're looking at an instrument which is going to be changing every 20 to 30 years in a different way in every city in Europe where, where it's being played, not to mention outside of Europe where also it's starting to become established. Um, and that means if, you, if you're wanting to have an appropriate or a, or a closely appropriate instrument for specific repertoires, you need a lot of gear, right? So you, you, I really, it's a different instrument for Mozart than for Weber and Beethoven, or for Weber or for Beethoven, because Viennese clarinets are different to German ones. And a different instrument again for French repertoire if you want to play Riker wing quintet and and then because the clarinet comes in lots of different keys you need lots of them <laughs> so um uh the reason the clarinet comes in lots of keys by the way is because uh pre-boom system clarinets weren't good at playing in tonalities with lots of sharps and flats 
um, they were they were not fully omnitonic. So the way around that, of course, was to build clarinets in A, in B flat, in C, so that you would you were you're always playing in a, a tonality of of no more than um, one or two sharps, two or three flats. That's that's why we have all these instruments. Um, and then composers also became attached to them for their different tonal qualities as well. Um, and in, in addition to the things like the low clarinets, the basset horns and the bass clarinets. So yeah, I mean, your kind of basic, if you want to do a classical period repertoire, um, then you need an A, a clarinet, a B flat clarinet and a C clarinet, and you need a basset horn. Um, and if you're being, if you're being really kind of, you know, serious about historical, um, uh, I, don't, I don't want to say accuracy, it's too hard a word, but you know, kind of really what the players use, you need a different set for Mozart than you do for, for for 19th century music as well. Um, so yeah, they accumulate very quickly. Um, I always say if you want to, if you're interested in getting into that stuff, don't worry too much about that to start with. Like the only way to do it is just to, to, to jump in, get an instrument and start messing around with it, um, basically. Because <laughs> th th that's, that's the only way to get going. Um, to get a, uh, a, you know, a decent basic B flat clarinet with um, somewhere between five and 10 keys. A five key clarinet would be a Mozart instrument. A 10 key instrument is a Weber instrument. And the, the, the skills you use to play a 10 key instrument kind of encompass a lot of what's going on on the five key clarinet. So you, you sort of, you can teach yourself Mozart technique on a 10 key clarinet, basically. Or you start with the five key instrument and then it becomes easier as you add more keys. So you can go either way with that. Um, but yeah, I, the, the only way to get started is to get started, is, you know, basically, and have fun with it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, as Sarah pointed out, I am tiptoeing tip my way into this world. We've had chats about it, um, you and I, um, Emily, and I hear like the number of clarinets and I'm like, who gonna fund it, girl? <laughs> but I'm curious to know um, what like what is your favorite clarinet like out of all the clarinets you have do you have a do you have a special one that's like mm, this is my baby that's like asking if I had children which one I preferred you know like you just <laughs> um I often I, I like the one I'm I'm playing at the time very often to be honest um because whenever you pick, an, a, pick a, a one out of the cupboard you haven't played for a while, it always feels a bit grumpy and it takes a while to kind of reform that relationship. And then after like, you get to the concert, like, oh, yeah, this is great. And then you put it away again to start all over again. Right. Um, that's kind of that's the frustrating thing. But um, so, I mean, I like they're all special in their way. I love my basset horn. Um, as you can see in one of the YouTube videos, just because it's such a special instrument, like it's so big and weird looking and and it makes such a great noise and it feels you know it's kind of it's really it's awkward to play but it feels great to play and it's also one of, that's one of those instruments that has really kept developing as I, i've had it since 2014 and i still each time i do an intensive patch on it it feels like i learn a bit more about it or it learns a bit more about me i know sometimes sometimes kind of something that used to be difficult will become easier because because these, these are also these, these are wooden instruments and the resonances in them develop as well so like i i discovered a d flat on there that i didn't have before which was nice, like a, kind of like a, um, what we call a cross fingered note when you when you, you you would close one two and then open and then one two in the right hand as well, which normally gives you this kind of slightly weird out of tune moaning noise. But if you get the voicing right and you kind of get the instrument to resonate, you can get um, a, a middle D flat C sharp if you if you're really lucky. And I haven't had one of those until the last couple of years on that instrument. So it's you know, that was exciting, right? That was an exciting thing. Um, but I also love my. Uh, my main instruments I play mo like most of all are my 10 key Grenza copies, which are kind of a Weber, Weber Beethoven instrument. They're my kind of like workhorses. They're very stable. They're very reliable. Um, I know where I am with them. Like they're my kind of main orchestral instruments. And then I also have these fantastic uh, copies of Richard Mulfelt's instruments, these Ottensteiner clarinets, which I have had for probably about four or five years now. And we're still we're still building our relationship. Like they're very... They're very special, they're very beautiful, but they're quite unlike. They are neither like a classical clarinet nor like a modern clarinet. They are their own thing completely um, in terms of the, the way they feel to play, right? Um, and so I think, I think a lot of people find that with, with this particular kind of clarinet that they, they really require like 
to you know to build a, a different relationship with it's kind of like they've got they've got a lot of the problems of both instruments <laughs> like a lot of the problems of the early clarinet, not the problems of the modern clarinet but like <laughs> somehow in one package i don't know but they're, they're kind of fascinating so you know i yeah and i got my bass clarinet over there which is a uh, a Mahler bass clarinet that's quite fun that's this week's project um sending Mahler for in a couple of weeks so that yeah. is amazing <laughs> I'm like shook and shocked and in love with all of this and like the descriptions it's like they're they're people they have personalities and I love it and I often think of my clarinets my modern ones in that sort of way so to really hear that these instruments develop over time and they they open and they, they they reveal different things about themselves as you get to know them. I love that. I'm looking forward to sort of that that part of the journey myself. Um, turning um, or going back to just something we talked about earlier um, regarding community and the clarinet. I'm really curious to know um, what does community look like for you, um, and how does that inform your work you do with your ensembles at the University of York where you teach. Um, and formally when you're at Huddersfield, like how does all of these things come together and, and inform the work that you do? Um, I think I, I, I kind of, they say, they say you have to kind of be the change you want in the world, right? I, I, I want the, the clarinet community generally to be a collegiate place. And I feel like the early clarinet world is actually, at least in the UK where I'm mostly working, I feel like it is pretty good at that. Like, I feel like we've got a situation where it doesn't feel like kind of lots of sharp elbows and competition. It, it feels like we kind of, you know, we're a community who look after each other and respect each other and, and pass gigs to each other and, you know, kind of. And I, I yeah, I kind of, I, I want to foster that that sense of there's there's just no point in looking at your colleagues as as competition. Yeah, you have to see them as 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 some people you're in a community because you're all in it together actually ultimately that's kind of how it is and you look after each other that's 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 the only way um so and I also think certainly for early clarinet players and maybe it's a little bit a clarinet player thing generally we have to be quite diverse and quite entrepreneurial to to exist as musicians in in today's world right I think COVID kind of really brought that to the fore um but yeah, we all have to do things other than play in order to, to to exist and so I try when I'm teaching to kind of reflect that to my students in a positive way it's not that oh there are no jobs in orchestras so don't, don't it's like you know every musician I know who is fulfilled as a musician does more than one thing and actually the only musicians I know who who don't seem so fulfilled tend to be the ones who, who who've you know got those dream orchestra jobs and then and then decided it wasn't maybe the life they wanted actually so um yeah I try I try to kind of yeah, reflect to my students that you know you don't you actually you know what you don't have to focus on one thing which is being the best fastest you know kind of most amazing auditioning clarinet player in the world because that that isn't going to be your whole life like yes do that but also cultivate your other interests whether they are other musical interests whether they are other broader life interests and then maybe that's the way actually to strike more of a balance um you know and or maybe those are the things that are going to be there when suddenly there's a big change in your life and you find you're no longer going to be doing what you thought you were going to be doing or maybe no longer want to do what you thought you wanted to do so I, I, I think just staying broad as people is the really key thing for me um yeah and and fostering community with with the people that you're going to have to work with <laughs> it sounds like um, just just from this chat, you know, playing historically informed performances is a lot about connection. You're connected to your community. You have to be connected to your body. You have to connect with the instruments. Like you're forming a lot of relationships, um, and and I think that's something that we can really, we really, I think as musicians, not just modern, but all musicians, maybe all people, really need to to explore. You know that kind of connection that that we have, that grounding that we have. Um, you have to connect to the historical context. Um, it's just uh, it's very holistic, uh, and I and I quite appreciate that. And and I hope my students listen to this. <laughs> um, I was wondering if I might, if I could um, ask you, what are some pieces like dream pieces that you'd love to play, or or projects that that you'd love to get out there so you know like a just something that you you haven't done yet that you really want to do 
Gosh, um, you know what? I've never done Beethoven nine. So that that's like you know kind of that that, that that's on my that that's that's the one piece that if I got to the end of my career and I still never done Beethoven nine I'd, I'd be sad about that um, in terms of an orchestral thing. Um, I mean, there's so much music out there. I, f for me, it's almost more. I love playing with different people, so I'm I'm currently starting to to um, uh, build up more of a of a of a line doing some work with piano, which I haven't done for a long time with a um, wonderful pianist. Uh, near me here in Yorkshire. Um, I I love working with strong quartets as well. Actually, getting, I'm getting my basset clarinet, my Mozart basset clarinet delivered quite soon. So I'm going to be going back into the old Mozart clarinet quintet, which I haven't touched for probably, uh, I played it once in the last 15, 20 years, I think, like, because I haven't had that particular instrument and I've been exploring other repertoire. Um, I think, and I, I am quite fascinated to explore a bit more the mid the kind of mid to late 19th century repertoire that's not Schumann and Brahms. Actually, I think there's an awful lot of stuff there that's very interesting. Um, but I mean, also, you know, I'd, I'd love to play, I'd love to play more opera as well, because that was such a huge part of, um, of the lives of most wind players in the period we're talking about. They were, you know, primarily they tended to be employed as opera in opera orchestras. And so, unless I'm doing that, I feel like I'm not getting the full picture, right, of, of what kind of musician they needed to be. So I'd love to play more opera. Um, but yeah, I, I think just, I don't know. It's all the music. I can't, I, I can't, I can't, I can't choose. That is gorgeous. And I love, I love your, 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 your excitement for the different varieties of music from all over the place. And, you know, it's just, that's off the heart of a true, like, you know, researcher and cultivator of, of great art. I just love that. So thank you so much for sharing that. One last question before we wrap up. Um, what is your favorite piece to play? <laughs> you, might, you might guess by now that I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to find this question easy to answer. Um, 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 I mean, I guess actually, okay, Desert Island clarinet repertoire. I think if I had, to, if I could only have one composer, it would be Brahms. Like, can I have one composer? I, I'm not sure I can choose one piece, but if I could take like Brahms with me, I'd probably, I could cope on a desert island with just that. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Worthington. It's been a pleasure working and talking and discussing with you today and just for being so gracious with your time and knowledge and just thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I, I quite appreciate it. I'm fired up again. I'm going to I'm going to give this historical clarinet stuff a try. I just really enjoy how connected uh, historical clarinetists are to the music that they're playing. Um, I, anytime we ask people their favorites for anything uh, in this context, everyone's like, I can't. There's no <laughs> there's no way. <laughs> so I, I am always inspired. So I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me.